Are you saying that the edges on the magazine rack were perfectly symmetrical as one can see on the striation? I never said they were per perfectly symmetrical. I said they had a parallel pattern. But let's let's look at it. For, for me, it looks perfectly symmetrical. Let's let's um, zoom in, and then and then you tell me if uh, I'm wrong or not. The pattern here is symmetrical. Symmetrical. Um, it's a. It's very strange to find perfectly symmetrical. Grain in wood, am I right? Not necessarily, my lady. It depends on the type of wood. But that is what you took into account. You took yes. into account it must have been the magazine rack. But there's one other aspect, Professor, that worries me in terms of being unbiased and, and taking everything into account. And that is photograph 1106. It, it's exhibit C, my lady. Photograph 1106. Look at that. That's a shirt shadow. Just uh, zoom in. Zoom in. Zoom in on that photograph. Let's see the perfectly symmetrical indications. You see that? The ribbing of the shirt. Did you take that into account? Uh, no, I didn't, my Why? lady. Why would you not? Because I still think that the tram track pattern that you referred to occurs uh, when a hard object impacts on skin or soft tissue. We see it typically when a rod or cane comes into contact with skin and causes this tram track pattern. Um, I don't think that this would, uh, the, the clothing would have caused that pattern. Why? If it's an impression and not a striation? I, I do not believe that this why? was firm enough to cause that pattern. But why did you not tell the court that I took this into account? I didn't take it into account. Why Maybe? not? She had a shirt on. You was gave evidence about a striation on a woman whilst she had a shirt on. Maybe I don't want to interfere, but maybe the courtesy of question answers. The witness is busy answering Mr. Nellis with his third question. Yes, Mr. Nell. Please lady? take your time. Uh, the witness may not have oh, may not have been done with the answer. Indeed. I apologise to the yes. court and I apologise to you, Professor Buerta. Yes. Please take your time and answer. My lady, I believe that that so-called tram track pattern was caused by uh, contact with a rigid surface. I think it's far more likely, now that, I've, that this has been drawn to my attention, that it was caused by the edge of... Uh, a hard object such as the magazine rack rather than the weave of the uh, clothing. Can you really say that? As an impression, mm -hmm. if a bullet ricocheted from the wall, hits her on, on the shirt, are you telling this court that would not have caused it? My lady, I did not say that. I said it's far more likely <coughs> that it was caused by a hard surface. Wait, let us, okay, let us just think, think, and I'm so glad you used the word like. She fell on the magazine rack with her shirt on. And you still say that the, the impressions on the magazine rack caused distractions. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying it is more probable. Why? She had a shirt on. My lady, as I've just said, I believe that the tram track pattern was the result of impact with a hard surface rather than with um, an item of clothing. There was I may be wrong, but that is my impression. Professor, you're not maybe wrong, you are wrong. There's an intervening shirt. Did you take that into account? No, I didn't originally. Why? It was there. Because I didn't <coughs> think it would cause such a pattern. Isn't it perhaps that you just wanted to say it's a striation caused by the magazine rack because that's the accused version? Isn't that why you gave that evidence? My, my lady, that is nonsense. I have not discussed this matter with the accused. He never gave me his version, and it's immaterial to me how that was caused. I'm trying to assist the court to the best of my ability. I'm not here to win the case or lose the case for either the state or the defence. I, I beg to differ. But you used the word nonsense. I wish I could, but I won't. Are you saying, now, stop, 
the striation marks on the wound of the back was caused by the magazine <coughs> and that the intervening shirt played no role. Lady, I'm saying that I believe it was far more likely to have been caused by contact with the magazine rack than by the shirt. Then, let's deal with the gastric contact. You have to agree with me. That in your years and years as a ballistic expert giving evidence in various courts, that every piece of evidence has its value that one can gather. Am I right? That is correct, my lady. <laughs> Some evidence is more valuable than others, but one usually, as an expert, look at, at everything that's available. Am I right? Yes, one should take a holistic view. And then one tests the probabilities of all the different pieces of evidence that, that one gathered. Am I correct? That is correct. Now, do you agree, and just listen to me, that every day, thousands and thousands of surgical and, and endoscopic procedures are undertaken on patients <coughs> on the basis that complete gastric emptying had taken place within four to six hours. Otherwise, we would put the patient's safety would be compromised. Am I correct? That is correct. Good. So that we have. Good. We have. We have. You agree with me? That within four to six hours, gastric emptying would have happened. No, my lady. Within four to six hours, in most patients, gastric emptying would have occurred. I'm so glad you said that because do you have any idea that it would not have happened in this instance? No. Exactly. Lady, that's totally speculative. I'm asking you, do you know of any reason why it would have been different from the norm in this specific instance? No, not particularly. No, I do not know. <coughs> also, in, in... Okay, let me just carry on. So, as far as you know, there were no major factors that would have to be taken into account to say that in this particular matter one would have to look for different physiological things in the disease. I am not aware of any okay. physiological or other factors. So you would expect a normal gastric end? Yes. I see. And then it comes in one of the the Bernard Knight book that you referred to. Um, can I refer to it as burning night? You would well, know it's, that. it's night's pathology. Yeah, page 88. In the bundle, my lady, that was uh, Mark GGG. The one page through it, there's the third edition of night's forensic pathology. And there was a um, copy from page 83 onwards to 88. And I would just want to, you to deal with one specific paragraph in it. It's page 88, uh, Professor, on the left-hand column. About the fourth paragraph starts with, even if one expects, accepts. Do you have that? Yes. Even if one accepts gastric trans transit time of an average meal has been of the order of two to three hours, the assumption that death took place within this time can only be valid if the death was quite sudden and unexpected. Yes. It was sudden and unexpected here, or, or do you have anything to think it wasn't? No, I have no reason to think it was anything otherwise. Okay. Then, uh, let me just, you've now agreed, but the paragraph I read to you about the, oh, the, the statement I put to you about the surgical and endoscopic procedures, that, that one finds in, um, what's the writer's name? J uh, James, Payne James, as well, at page, my lady, that's the first article in the bundle. If one turns the page, 
at 109. Do you have that? Yes, I do. Uh, on the, on the right-hand column, second paragraph, where it says, the following gastric emptying times are given in the liter literature, one to three hours for a light, small volume meal, three to five for a medium-sized meal, five to eight for a large meal. Then, but it's important what I, I want to put to you. It should be noted over that normal individuals prior to upper gastrointestinal endoscopy, a six hour null per mouth period ensures that initially every stomach is empty. It is irrespective of precise food type and that often a four hour period will ensure that the stomach is empty. Do you agree with that? I agree with that. <coughs> oh. Now, On the hip wood, uh, I'm going to ask that we just get it on the screen and let's just look at the wood. C1121. You see that? Yes, I do. Now, let us forget how it was described in the reports. Let's just look at the photograph. The color of abrasion is irregular at the uppermost part. Yes, it is eccentric. And if I remember correctly, Professor Simon uh, said it varied, I think, one to two millimeters of one extremity and about nine, eight or nine millimeters on the other side. That's not a typical entrance. No, it's an atypical entrance. It's an atypical entrance. Atypical. Now, let us explain to what we mean if we say atypical. Atypical means it passed through an intermediate target. Yes. Okay. So that we agree. Now, I know you're not an expert of flight ballistics. Are you? No. But with all your experience, you would accept at least that the bullet shot through a solid door would have become unstuck. It There are two things that might happen, my lady. It may become unstable or it may become, if it goes through an intermediate target, it may become slightly or somewhat default. Yes, indeed. Indeed. And in this instance, we know that she had a pencil. Do you know that? Yes. Would that have affected the color, color of abrasion to an extent? I doubt whether it would have had any significant effect. It may, but I doubt it. But then, only on, on what you said as far as <coughs> unstable, slightly deformed is concerned, one cannot really indicate her body position, or make a uh, finding on her body position, <coughs> on an unstable deformed bullet, on the collar of abrasion. Am I right? I disagree with that, my lady. Well, but the challenge. Okay, sorry. I disagree with that. The uh, perforation is reasonably symmetrical, not 100%, but um, I do not think that the uh, point that's been put to me is necessary, sir. The left lower edge, that's scallop. Does that make it? A... Oh, we see that on an everyday basis, my lady. That's, I can't read anything significant into that slight scallop. Well, Professor, the challenge stands. Perhaps people will call a ballistic expert, but I challenge you still to find any literature that would indicate that you can make any finding on a cholera abrasion of a bullet that became unstable and or slightly deformed, having gone through immediate target. You won't be able to. You just want to say it. Larry, as I said before, that's not what I want to say. I'm saying what I believe to be the truth. One thing we'll agree on. It wasn't the perfectly stable projectile that, that caused that wound. It shouldn't have been, Larry. But it wasn't. I said it shouldn't have been a perfectly Why? stable. Why? Because it went through an intermediate target. Now, um, on your finding 
that you wouldn't have expected. Before we get there, before we get there, now that I look at the Mr. door. Mr. Nell, your, your voice is getting... Uh, I apologise. Um, now that I look at the door again, do you know the accused version on how he fired the shots? No, I don't. Do you know what a double tap is? Yes, I do know what a double tap is. Do you, you know that he said he used two double taps? Yes, I did hear that. Oh. And still, you say that a double tap on A would have caused one of the other ones as well. A double tap is immediate, isn't it? Doof, doof. That's correct. Now, let's say doof, doof. Something must have happened from doof, the first doof. Because if the first doof was an A, which would be the following? Well, lady, I think we've canvassed this already. I am not certain of the sequence of the bullet wounds in the door. I'm not certain. I think A is probably the first. But in any shooting, the position of the, the shottest changes, the angle of the firearm changes. I can't say with certainty that the next one was B, C or D. You know why I'm asking you these questions? Your words when you started giving evidence, you say, Milady, I will tell the court that that's just me. That's not what you said. You said, in all probability, the sequence was. Now I'm testing you. Now you're saying, I don't know. Milady, that is not what I'm saying. What I, was, saying? I never commented on the sequence of holes in the door. I commented <laughs> on the sequence of the injuries to the deceased. That's a totally different situation. Yeah, but you can't divorce the two. You can't, if you want to tell the court which, which hit first, because on the sequence of the wounds, B could have hit her in the head, am I right? Yes, could have. No, but it's wrong, because it missed. Lord, Mr. Nell says so. I, I accept that, but I can't, on the position of the holes in the wall, say with any certainty which of the wounds were, co were associated with which particular hole I'm in the door. testing your premise, Doctor. I'm not putting anything to you. I'm saying you gave... You said, milady, in all probability, the sequence was, and then you start. The first one was in the hip. And, and you, Indy, just from looking at the injuries, you established that the first one is in the hip. Just the injuries. See, the pattern of the injuries, the location of the injuries, and the likely results of the injuries. My opinion was that the first injury was on me. I just want to get it clear. You just looked at the injuries, never at the door, in, in getting to your conclusion. My lady, I don't know how much one can learn from the door because of the relatively close grouping of the holes and the possibility that the angle of the firearm changed between shots. Mr. Britta, you said to the court what you didn't think. I asked you a more positive question. It is. Did you take the door into account and the position of the bullet holes? Yes or no? I took into account the height and number of the bullet holes in the door. Oh, so you took into account the height. But I was not able and I don't think it's my job to indicate which bullet hole correlates with which wound <laughs> on the body. That is a ballistician's uh, function. I'm testing you, your version, doctor. You could... The ballisticians will come. I'm testing your version. It's all on. Now, now we have, a, we have a concession that you took into account the height of the holes. How did that help? You correlate the height of the holes with the height of the deceased and the possible position of the deceased. So B could have... But now you know we have to exclude B. Did you, did you take the height of B into account? I took the height of all four into account. What did you, before I now told you that B missed, what did you think of B? I'm still not certain that B missed, my lady. You know what... I, You've been caught thousands of times. Mr. Roo will be up and he will tell the court that I'm putting to you something that's not true. So please take it from me. Just take it from me. I will not put things to you that's not true.
be missed. Did you take that into account? Did you? I took into account the number of I, I think that would be more correctly put to say on that was Mr. Mangena, Captain Mangena's version. That, that's the only thing. It's not that it's fact, it's his version. There was never an agreement on that. The only way I can now deal with it is through you. Uh, Milady, I'll, I'll deal with it through the witness. It was never put to Captain Mangena in cross-examination that B is not the, the, the bullet hole that caused the E and ricochet F. It was never put to him. Therefore, it was accepted. What do you say about that? I wasn't in court at the time, Milady. I can't comment on that. I put to you, Captain Mangena gave evidence. A bullet went through B. It hit the wall E. It ricocheted to F. It was never put to him. That's not, that's not so. So you can accept it from B must. So we need to be into account the height of B. And you didn't know it must. How, did it, how would it affect your sequence? Well, lady, I said very clearly that the chronological sequence of the wounds were firstly, I think she incurred the wound over the hip. The second one was the arm. The third wound was the head. I said I was uncertain about the uh, bullet that ricocheted. I thought it was probably the third or fourth. I wasn't certain. I made that quite clear. I was not dogmatic. Now, looking at the injuries only and the height of the bullet dog. What allows you to conclude that the first shot was in the air? Because I believe that she was standing upright and she was slightly flexed. Why? Because of the appearance of the entry wound, my lady. Why would that not be the one through the, the hand? The first wound. If she was standing upright or semi-erect or whatever, the wound through the arm is at a higher level than the wound over the hip. I considered that the most likely scenario was a wound in the hip that would cause her to fall, and as she came down, the other wounds would then be at more or less the same level, striking her while she was falling in the arm and then in the hip. That I considered the most likely scenario. By just looking at the wound and the height of the wound? Yes. And then what the effects of the wounds would be. Why is that important? Because, my lady, if she was shot in the hip, she would have been falling. If she was shot in the head, I would have great difficulty correlating any of those with the deceased standing um, upright or even in a flexed position. For once, I agree with you. The head wound could not have been the first one. No, I, I believe that the head wound was in all probability the final wound. But then, if that happens, then I have a difficulty, uh, Professor, with you, your version about screams. Now, Professor Simon said he would be surprised if she didn't scream. Was it wrong? My lady, I think I already said that it will depend on the time interval over which the shots were fired. If they were all fired over four seconds, for example, which is possible, I don't know, then uh, I don't know what the rapidity of the shots were. If they were fired over four seconds, I don't think she would have had a chance to scream. After being hit initially, I think there would have been panic confusion, um, and I think that she would probably have taken a couple of seconds to react, Let us by which time she was probably hit by the succeeding bullets. You see, but if, sorry, Mr. Nell, I'm still busy, but if, and I said it earlier, if there was an interval of several seconds between the shots, then I think she could well have cried, cried out. 
Are you now there? Oh. At last. Thank you, Good. my lady. There, there's one other aspect that you did not take into account. If in the toilet she was a mortal fear, she was scared. If, if in the toilet she was in mortal fear, she would, and the shot would ring out, you would expect her to scream. I would. Because there, there won't be a shock and a surprise. Um, lady, as I've just said, I don't know how quickly she could have reacted. She may, to use a later mean, frozen with fear for a second or two. I don't know. That's, again, speculative. No, yeah. I'm using your speculation. Now you're telling me we're speculating. I'm using yours by saying that she wouldn't scream. If she's a mortal fear, she would have been prime. Am I right? Everything would have been on edge. She's scared of something. Bullet was fired. You, doctor, let us use the, what's something that's easy for you. It would be possible that you would have said, yes. Okay, good. Let's we'll take it one step further. You would have been, having been in mortal fear, primed, it would be likely, <coughs> Professor, it would be likely, am I right? Well, if she was You're primed. whispering, Mr. Nell. Am I speaking softly? Yes. Uh, I, I do apologize. Lady, if she was primed in mortal fear, yes. Okay. If, it were, if she was shot, say, out of the blue, and, she was, and this was totally by surprise, then I think that uh, it's much less likely that she would have escaped. You know, both the state and the defence version is that she was primed, that she was in fear. Did you take that into account? No. Why not? But I wasn't informed of that, Mr. I wasn't aware that she'd been primed, my lady. Now, on the accused version, he ran. Oh, let's uh, let me use the word ran. I apologise. He moved quickly to the bathroom, shouting at Reva, phone the police, phone the police. He's shouting at intruders to get out. On his version, she's sitting there hearing this. That would prime her? Yes, it would. And then you would expect her to speak? Yes. Start screaming. Yes. Doctor, as far as the bladder content is concerned, you correct that on average 60 millimeters per hour is formed. Roughly, my lady. But, but that's not a cons constant. I no, mean, no, not at all. The peaks and troughs and, and, and so forth. It's worked out on the basis that the average person produces 1,400 about 1,400 milliliters, and if one works that out over a 24 hour period, it works at about 60 uh, uh, milliliters per hour, but that can vary tremendously. Having found five milliliters of urine in the bladder, can you exclude her uh, having voided the bladder 15 minutes before? No. Can't. Thank you, my lady. I have nothing further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nell. Mr. Roo? Thank you, my lady. Professor. Maybe just one correction. It is indeed so that I put an ask to Mr. Mangena about a double tap shooting. However, I think it's appropriate that I put on record directly after adjournment. I was told that I was wrong. That was not the version, but that it was in rapid succession. It was incorrectly put by me. So let me correct that. Now, let's work on that. You don't hear evidence that the deceased was told that she was going to be shot. That is correct, my lady. You hear phone the police and you hear get out. Now, if you talk about priming, with the four shots coming suddenly, what would you then say what would a normal reaction be? Uh. My lady, if I understand that correctly, totally unexpectedly. Yes. I not, not, a, not a warning. I am going to shoot you. I think that a person in this position who is behind a locked door and suddenly is shot would be totally taken aback, as I said, would be panic-stricken, and I think that there may be a lapse, there's likely to be a lapse of a couple of seconds before that person is capable of reacting. And if the shots were fired in rapid succession, say within a period of about 
four to five seconds. I think that the deceased would have been struck by the succeeding bullets before having the opportunity, if you would want, want to put it that way. Yes. Now, you were also questioned on how wrong you would be to say that she leaned forward. Do you remember that? That is correct. As a matter of interest, that was conceded by Captain Mangena as a possibility with reference to the wound. So that was not denied. Thank you. Secondly, if that would help you in your answer, is paragraph 18.5 of his report also spoke about minimal bullet deflection. Now take that into account and look at the injury caused by the hip. What is your, your view? Well, Lady, if I remember correctly, I think the amount of deflection you mentioned was something like three or four percent, uh, three or four degrees. Mm -hmm. Really minimal. And I stand what I said. I still think that the edges are slightly irregular, that one would expect this with a slightly deformed or, tumbling bu or a tumbling bullet or a somewhat deformed bullet. Uh, I think the comment about the eccentric color abrasion is still valid. I think it still indicates that the deceased body was flexed at the time. You were shown the shirt. Of course, we do not know if the shirt moved up and covered that portion of the back when she fell down. That we don't know. That nothing was put to you in that respect. That is good. But more importantly, what was also not shown to you or put to you, that there were holes in the shirt at the back. Now, take that into account. Uh, there were no holes in the, in the back of the shirt. Yes, I said it was not put that there were. If you take talon, black talon, and the fragments, and the talons, so to speak, what would you say about that? My lady, if the jacket or the shirt, uh, the jacket of the, the... The jacket comprising the talons or petals, they would have torn the shirt. And I think if it had been the solid core, one would have found a perforation of the shirt. If you go back to the the mark, the marks on the back. <laughs> Is the stretching of the skin at all relevant? Yes, in a frictional type injury, the skin may well stretch. Not necessarily so, but it may. Now, I'm trying to understand on Captain Mangena's evidence sitting on a magazine rack. How would, the, how would you explain the ricochet causing the two marks? A, by looking at the marks that the, the, the wounds caused, and B, the position. Well, lady, I find it very difficult to reconcile those two injuries on the back with a bullet or bullet components. Um, the, I, I believe there is another explanation, and I believe the, the best, the most likely, is hard impact type uh, injury in falling against the magazine back. I, I really can't understand how those two wounds on the back could have been caused by a bullet. You then refer to, and I didn't take you to it, but you refer to the wounds in the front and the, the chest to that show the difference. Yes. If I may just get that, ask you to explain that.
They may just ask for assistance by the photographer. There's a photo showing Mark on the chest. <coughs> and if you could please first switch it off from the main screen. Thank you. If you can, I might just ask assistance to identify the photo, the image number. One, one, two, three. one, one, two, three, just for the record purposes. Professor, was, was that the photograph that you referred to? That is correct, my lady. Could, could you explain now, with reference to the photograph, what, what, what your evidence was? Uh, my lady, if one looks at this, there are firstly several small punctate wounds um, at about from 3 o'clock to roughly 5 o'clock. There is another wound uh, at 12 o'clock, which actually looks as if there's a break in the skin. And then there are two black lesions. And they look like dried out abrasions, but the two at approximately 10 and 11 o'clock have, have a roughly, roughly elongated triangular appearance. And if one looks at the largest of the injuries, the central one, at the superior margin, there also looks, there's a linear uh, mark which also looks like a superficial laceration. Uh, this is the type of injury I would expect with portions of the jacket impacting on the skin. This, I think, is entirely consistent with an injury of, uh, caused by black talon ammunition where uh, the uh, jacket has separated from the core. Could you find any of these marks in, the, in respect of the wounds at the back? No, they are totally dissimilar to this, my lady. That's apart from that there's no yeah. hole in the yes. garment. Thank you, my lady. Let me support, my lady. I am totally surprised by what Mr. Ruth said about the double tap. That happened with, with the evidence of Captain Mangena. After Captain Mangena, we had from the nest, we had um, lots of other people. I am surprised. It's the first word I heard that it's not the defence case, that it's a double tap anymore. Based on that, may I just deal with this witness on the understanding that it's not their evidence that it was a double tap. <coughs> because when I cross-examined this witness, it was with the understanding that it's a defence case that it was a double tap and not four shots in succession and rapid shots, which changes my cross-examination of this witness and the doorman. So I beg leave to deal with that aspect that I did not know before I cross-examined this witness. Yes. Thank you. Please, please proceed. You now know that we've now heard it was a rapid succession. You've heard that. I've heard that. Minute. Now... On rapid succession, if she, if she was standing upright at A, and if those shots were fired rapidly, we know B didn't hit her. How did C and D hit her then? On, on your version, I'm standing upright, slightly bent forward, at A. B missed. How did C and D hit me? Can you explain that? I'm not certain. I also feel like laughing. I'm, I'm not laughing, my lady. Um, but the thing is, if somebody fires in rapid succession, um, unless you're a very skilled marksman, 
the firearm moves around. With uh, rapid firing, for example, it tends to lift. Um, there is some, the grouping is reasonable, but as I said, there is movement. Uh, the highest and the lowest holes are about uh, 11 centimeters apart. But uh, I, I don't know how this alters the scenario. No, no, it, on your version, Doctor, on your version. Remember you said you took into account two things. Injuries, height of the bullets. Remember you said that? Yes. Okay. Now we, he, now we hear that was rapid fire. The word used was rapid fire, so doof, 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 doof. Now, if that is so, and A is the hip width, how did it get to the head and, and, and the shoulder on your bed? Well, lady, as I said, I think after it's a standing hip wound, there was instability of the hip, and she started falling. Yeah, okay, one. So it's hit one, two. Now, where's my head? I think the, the head wound was probably the last. As she fell, she, as I said, I suspect it was a rotational element. It was shortly thereafter that she was second or two, later she was hit in the arm, and then finally in the head. But we know the head was at the toilet lid, behind the toilet lid. That we know. You, you conceded to that. Yes. So, in rapid fire, this all happened. A heater, C heater, D heater, B mister, but the head was at the toilet. Really, Doctor, the fact that it's rapid fire doesn't help you. On your no, all I can say is that bodies do fall, they can fall very rapidly. But there might be something different that I think of now. Yeah. You know, if I hit her and she was bent forward, I mean, D and C, a hit must have been in the area of D and C. Or wasn't she bent that far? I think she was flexed. Flexed. Flexed, been hit in the hip, yeah. and then she had a virtual collapse of the right hip joint, and then she fell fairly rapidly. Uh, the distance between the hip joint and the arm is not that great. I think that was the second shot, and then I think the final shot that uh, was inflicted was the head wound. It gets less probable. Totally less probable because I remember now what you said. You said she was hit in the right hip. Am I right? That was and correct. she fell to the right. I, I, no, I said she probably fell backwards with a slight rotation to the right. That rotation must, must not have been slight, must be big because the hip must get down to C and D. Not necessarily if she fell backwards. Okay. If, she, if she fell backwards, Oh, that makes sense because that removes the arm from the door and then we can all explain the splinters. Because if she fell backwards, her arm is away from the door, going away furthermore. It will be going away, but I don't know what distance it was. Yeah, from nobody there. does. Not on your version, nobody does. So that is, uh, you know, Professor, on rapid shots, your version makes less sense. And you're not willing to concede. Well, Eric, I think I made it quite clear that this was my interpretation of the likely wounding pattern. I'm not prepared to be dogma dogmatic about this. No, 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 no. There is no place for dogmatism in forensic medicine. It's dangerous and misleading. But I'm saying this, I think, is the most likely scenario. Yeah, but remember where we started off the tea. We said... We won't be dogmatic, but every piece of evidence we'll take and we'll try and build a picture, and you agreed 100%. That's not being dogmatic, that's just looking at the evidence and using it. That's available. Am I right? There's yes. a difference between yes. being dogmatic and using all the evidence. Yes, yes. so that's we're not dogmatic. <laughs> now, if I'm being fought and I'm here, why not fall? Not necessarily, no. Why not? What would you expect? What would the reasonable norm be? I would expect the person, the, the right leg would, in effect, collapse under her. But I'm leaning forward. I'm leaning forward. Now my right hip collapsed. Why would I, on your vision, why would I fall backwards? Why would I get up? 
She starts falling, lady. She's then hit in the arm, and then I collapses backwards. You know, I'm, I'm hit in the hip. Why did I just fall like that? Not necessarily. Uh, I think I've, I've done enough, Doctor. It doesn't make sense at all. Thank you, lady. Thank you very much. Mr. Roo? No further questions. Thank, Thank you, lady. Thank you very much, Professor, for your Thank assistance. You, you may be excused. Thank you. May I just have a word with the witnesses? Thank you, my lady. I call Mr. Pistorius. Witness may be sworn in. Sir, please state your full name, Mr. Reichel. My name is Oscar Leonard Carl Pistorius. Do you have any objection in taking the prescribed oath? I don't, my lady. Do you consider the prescribed oath to be binding on a conscience? I do, my lady. Do you swear that the evidence about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, raise your right hand and see how we go. So help me God. What must be sworn in, my lady? Thank you. Will you need she? You may be seated so, if you should so wish. Um, Yes, Mr. Ruth. Thank you. Mr. Pistorius, when I explained to you that your evidence would be presented by dealing with your background and moving on, you mentioned that there's something that you want to do first. Yes. What is that, Mr. Pistorius? Um, my lady, if I may just please start off with my evidence by tendering an apology. What is the apology that you want to tender, Mr. Pistorius? Um, I, haven't, um, I would like to take this opportunity. Um, to apologize to um, Mrs. and Mr. Mr. Stiankamp to Reba's family, to um, those of you who knew her who are here today, family um, and Mr. friends, man. Yes, I, I don't like doing this to you, but I, I can hardly hear you. I'm, I, I beg your pardon, my lady, I'll speak up. I'd like to apologize and say that there's not a moment and there hasn't been a moment um, since since this tragedy happened that I haven't thought about uh, your family. I wake up every morning and you're the first people I think of, the first people I pray for. I can't imagine the, the pain and the sorrow and the emptiness that I've caused you and your family. Uh, I was simply trying to protect Riva. I can promise that when she went to bed that night she felt loved. I've tried to put my words on paper many, many times to write to you, but no words would ever suffice. Mr. Pistorius, I, I know you want to face Mrs. Steenkamp when you apologize, but there's one difficulty, and, and that is that 
the court must hear you and must be in a position to hear you. And the only way we can do it is you talk in the direction of a ladyship. Will, will it be possible to do that? <coughs> yes. Mr. Pistorius, are you on medication? Um, yes, my lady, I've been on medication since last year, um, um, about the third week of February. Um, I've changed my medication over the course of the last uh, over the course of the last 14 months. What what medication do you use? Um, I was I was put on. Um, uh, an antidepressive called uh, Supramol, and uh, in, in uh, the beginning of last year, I started taking a sleeping sedative called uh, called Normison, and later on, um, I changed. I got my medicine changed to uh, a medicine called uh, Ciprolex and um, Dormanoct and Molipaxin, my lady. Do you, do you have a difficulty in sleeping? Uh, I do, my lady. Um, <coughs> um, I'm scared to sleep. Uh, For, for, for several reasons, but uh, I have I have terrible nightmares about about things that happen at night where I wake up and I smell I can smell um, I can smell uh, blood and I wake up to being terrified. Um, <laughs> if I hear a noise, I wake up. Uh, just in a, in, a, in a complete state of terror. Um, to a point that I'd rather not sleep than um, than fall asleep and, and wake up like that. So for for many weeks I didn't sleep. And I, um, in uh, March, April last year, I'd lost a significant amount of weight and um, from my care of my family, um, I sought medical advice to. Um, to to start um, medication for for sleeping. <coughs> you told me finding getting into a cupboard. Can you tell the court about that? Um, Um, I, I can't remember if it was towards the end of last year or the beginning of this year. I woke up in a, in a panic, and um, I'm, I'm blessed that my sister stays on the same property as I do, so I can phone her in the middle of the night, which I often do, to come and sit by me. And um, on that particular night, uh, I don't obviously ever want to handle a firearm again or be around uh, a firearm, so I've got a a security guard that stands outside of my front door at night. But I woke up and I was terrified and I, um, I for some reason couldn't calm myself down. So uh, I, I climbed into the cupboard and I phoned my sister to come and sit by me for a while, which she did. My lady. Mr. Pistorius, going to your background, when were you born? My lady, may I please be seated? Yes, please take a seat. I was born in um, I was born on the 11th of uh, 22nd of November 1986 in Johannesburg. And your family situation? How many siblings? Where do you fit in? Um, I'm the middle child. I have, um, I've got two siblings. I've got a brother who's 18 months older than I am, and I've got a sister who's 24 months younger than I am. And the relationship between you and your brother and your sister? We've we've grown up very close. My family, so we're a tight knit family. 
the situation with your parents? Um, my parents, my my parents um, separated when I was young, and my mother passed away when I was fifteen. How old were you when your mother passed away? I was fifteen, my lady. Now, as as a child, as a little child, uh, could you explain and sketch to the court your situation at the, at home? What was the relationship with your mother? What was the relationship with your father? I grew up in a, in a loving home. Um, my father wasn't often around. He, uh, he's, he works, he's always worked very, uh, you know, away from home. So we grew up mostly with my mother, with my mother and um, she was a very caring, uh, soft-hearted natured person. Um, she was a she was a fantastic parent. Um, when my parents got separated when I was young, um, we didn't have our financial means were were, were very difficult. But with the help of our extended family, um, we were never made to feel like we needed anything. Um, my mother worked at a government high school as a secretary, and so we got the holidays with her. Um, through arts, the period from when I was in primary school, so six to uh, high school, um, seven, sorry, seven to, to high school, we, we grew up with my mother and um, we moved around a fair deal. Um, and uh, my mother got remarried when, when I was uh, 14. How old were you when your parents separated? Um, I was six, six years old. We know about the difficulty with your legs. Could you explain to the court exactly what that is? Um. I wouldn't say there's a difficulty with my legs. I'd say that I've, I'm, I've got prosthetic legs that allow me to help me to overcome those disabilities or those difficulties. It's a difficulty would be when I don't have my, my legs on. I don't have balance. Um, I have very limited mobility. Meaning what I rather mean, Mr. Pistorius, when you were born, what was the situation? I mean, it's, I know it's hearsay, but we'll come in with from the point that you know. Um, uh, when I was when I was born, I had a missing. I was born with a born def with a birth defect, so I was born with missing fibula, which is one of the two bones between the knee and the, the knee and the ankle. Um, and were you my, missing fibula on both sides? I was missing fibula on both legs, and um, my, my parents consulted with many medical practitioners, and they thought that the best would be to amputate my leg between on both my legs between the ankle and the knee joint. Um, they did so when I was 11 months old, and when I was 13 months old, I got my first uh, prosthetic leg, which was a conical shape. It wasn't really a prosthetic leg with a foot, um, but I learned how to um, to stand up with them and to move around and uh, I walked when I was 17 months old and then on really uh, fairly regular intervals I, I had to get prosthetics made because um, I was growing and uh, the technology they had in, 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 in those days wasn't very good so um, it didn't allow the prosthetic feet just weren't very comfortable so I got them done uh, fairly regularly what was your mother's approach to you not, you, with you born with this disability? My mother was uh, very supportive. She, I remember when my brother went to school, um, she said to me that she wasn't going to, she was a bit um, carefree, she said she wasn't going to do two trips so I must find a sport to do. And she never made me feel any different to the rest of the kids. She, um, she didn't ever want me to see my disability as a as um, something that should hold me back. So she, she, um, 
she just kind of allowed me to pursue uh, sports and things, and she didn't chase after me. You know, she, if I fell, she left me to get up for myself, and she didn't baby me. She treated me exactly the same as my, as my brother and my sister. Where did you go to for primary school purposes? I uh, attended primary school um, at Constantia Cliff Primary uh, School on the West Rand. And uh, during your time at the primary school, was there any difficulties with the disability? Um, the prosthetic legs that I had then were very heavy, um, so they didn't really allow me to be as mobile as, as I was at later years when the technology got better. But um, it was, I guess, it was difficult. Um, you know, kids always, I think, uh, they, they, they don't always uh, know. It's not that they, they're just untainted when it comes to opinions and something that's different isn't always, the, you know, that isn't the norm is seen as, as something that needs to be explored. So I think that was difficult for me to adapt. I'd grown up not thinking I was any different and then met, uh, you know, surroundings where I was treated differently, but over time people's perceptions of me changed because they saw how I viewed myself, so they didn't, um, you know, they, they didn't see me as being any different at times. Did you encounter during primary school any difficulty with the other children? On a, on a couple of occasions, but it was never... Such as? Um, uh, there were just one or two occasions where I got uh, bullied or uh, pushed around, but my parents, um, you know, they always taught me to stick up for myself. And um, Meaning I, if you go home now and you tell your mother or your father that you were bullied that day by another child, what, what would their approach be or your mother's approach be? My, my family uh, have always believed in standing up for yourself and for uh, standing up for what you believe in. I come from a family um, where we were taught that uh, we don't come, you know, cry to our parents at the end of the day. So my mother, there was, I remember a situation where my buttons got torn off my shirt and my mother sent me to school the next day and said to me that I must get my, you know, that if my shirt came back that way the next day, um, it uh, should send it home with the other kids' um, parents. and. It happened the next day, and I got called into the headmaster's office for... Uh, Why? What was wrong with you? I stood up for myself, and I, I got into a physical altercation with this other kid. Uh, and um, when I got called in, my mother arrived, and she just basically said to the headmaster that she doesn't think that it's wrong for her kids to stand up for what they believe in and for getting bullied, and that she wouldn't be back. And she gave the shirt to the kid's parents, and... and and told them to bring it back when it was when it was repaired. What type of sport did you participate in at primary school? Uh, my lady, I did most sports. Uh, I didn't. I wasn't very good at any of them, but I tried most of them. Uh, I tried football and cricket, and then I started tennis um, when I was about ten, and I I played fairly well. Um, I enjoyed. I just enjoyed many sports. We so did many sports outside of school. My, my brother and I did uh, canoeing and wrestling, and um, we were just taught to. Or um, you know, my mother wanted us to be um, more rounded and experience. You know, get over my physical limitations by experiencing different sports. Your mother did. She, did she have any security concerns? Yeah. You know, um, my mother had a lot of security concerns. Um, we obviously grew up in a family where uh, my father wasn't around much, so my mother, she, she had a pistol. Um, and um, she would often get scared at night and she would phone, phone the police. We didn't stay in the best of suburbs and there was often crime in the area. Um, on a couple of occasions they did break into our home, but more than often than not, uh, it was just her being scared, and so she'd come, you know, at nights and call us to go sit in her room. And many times we'd just wait for the for the police to arrive. Mr. Storis, can you speak up a little bit, if possible, please? Where did she keep her firearm, for instance? 
Uh, my lady, she kept her firearm um, on a on a um, under her bed, uh, under, and in a just under her pillow, in a in a padded um, in a padded leather type of bag. You said something about pillow. I could not hear you. Sorry, she kept her firearm in a in a in a in a padded uh, bag under her pillow. And in your, where did you go to high school? I went to boarding school at Pretoria Boys High. How did that happen that you went to boarding school? Um, in my standard five year, I wanted to, um, wanted to go to a boarding school and um, I'd been with a friend of mine who was at Constantia Cliff Primary with me to watch one of his older brothers play cricket uh, on a Saturday afternoon. And uh, I accompanied him and I fell in love with the school and what it had to offer. And uh, when I got home, I discussed it with my mom and I said to her if I could, I'd really like to go to, to uh, that school. <laughs> and she discussed it with family members of mine and um, the next year, the following year, I went. So I started attending Pretoria Boys High, and my my brother moved schools and, and joined me there. And at high school, what was your relationship with the other scholars? Um, I had a mixed group of friends. So I, many of them I still speak to today. Um, I wasn't a part of any specific group. I had, I had uh, friends that were very um, talented uh, in sports and other friends that were very gifted academically. Um, and I was pretty much just seen as, a, as one, of the, one of the, I guess, one of the boys. Um, I started sport fairly on, and I was never really much of an academic, but uh, I tried to do my best. and, and um, I enjoyed the time I had there. What, what sport did you participate in? It? Um, I, did, I did rugby and water polo. And then at a later stage, I moved over to athletics. I did rugby and water polo, my lady, and at a later point, I moved over to athletics. When did you move over, the, over to athletics? And um, how did it come about? I'd, I'd been playing a rugby game in, uh, in my uh, Form 3 year, which was standard 8. And... Um, I'd had a knee injury, and part of my sport rehabilitation, um, I was seeing a biokineticist at the University of Pretoria, and um, he suggested to me that I meet with a, with a coach at the uh, university um, to help with my fitness, and so I met with him. Um, it was in uh, September 2003 about, and um, we had a chat, and... Um, in January 2004, I started training with him, and I was supposed to train with him for, for four months and then go back to rugby. And um, he, uh, he asked me to participate in a, in a disabled athletics meeting in, in Durban in the end of March. And um, I'd never participated in, in a disabled event before, so um, I was maybe a bit hesitant in the beginning. I didn't know what to expect, and I hadn't grown up with uh, with feeling like I had a disability. Um, I went down and I, I ran the events, and I came back up. Um, and I started rugby, and about two weeks in, um, this coach phoned me and he said to me, would I like to go run in America at a Paralympic event? And I'd never <coughs> been overseas before, so I, I, um, I took up the opportunity. And when I got back uh, that same year in 2004, my name was on the, on the South African team for the Paralympics. And so I went to the Paralympics and I, I discovered Paralympic sports for the first time. And um, I knew that that's you know, one thing that I'd really love to get involved in. And I never went back to any other sport after that. I focused on athletics and then in my matric year, I started the 400 meters. Um, and in that year, I went to the Able Body Senior Championships in Durban, and I ran, ran there, and I ran fairly well. And then it just progressed from there on out. Now, you said that your mother passed away when you were 15. What effect did that have on you? Um, if you could maybe just give more about your relationship with your mother and 
and the effect of, of her passing? Um, my mother was a very important person to, to, um, to us, to my brother and sister and I. Um, although my parents got uh, divorced when I was, with them when I was quite young, um, my, my father's family, they kept in close contact with her. And they were, she had a loving relationship with all of them. And, um, I mean, we spent all our time with her. Everything we, we learned in life, I learned from, from her. Um, and when she passed away, it was very unexpected. It was, uh, I just started boarding school. She just got married, uh, remarried. And, um, um, uh, we didn't even, my brother and I didn't even know she was sick. We, we, uh, we were just informed. We hadn't been home for uh, sometimes on the weekends as a boarder. You stay in at the hostel. So we weren't informed that she was sick. And by the time we were, she was already uh, in a coma. And then for about a two-week period, I think, back and forth, uh, there were some days where, where she got, uh, where the doctors wanted us to go through. So we'd leave school in the middle of the day and and go through to Johannesburg where she was and um, we'd sit by her and then the other day she got better and we'd go back to school and it kind of carried on and then uh, the one day they phoned us and they said we must rush to to Johannesburg and uh, I think we were there for about 10 minutes before she passed. After, after her passing, where did you reside? I know you attended boarding school but what about the weekends? Um, on the weekends and, and school holidays, the weekends um, we all, uh, my brother, sister, and I, kind of, uh, my sister was staying with my with my godmother, my my mom's sister, my aunt in Johannesburg. She finished school at Constantia Cliff, and uh, she started attending a high school in Johannesburg. So, um, my brother and I would kind of do our our own thing on the weekends. We'd stay at uh, family or friends. Um, we'd stay with my dad's brother, my uncle, or my mom's sister in Johannesburg. Or we'd just stay with friends and we'd we'll stay in at hostel. We wouldn't really uh, stay anywhere in particular. And during school holidays? Uh, school holidays, we'd, we'd usually go um, to a family's, uh, to a family or a friend's house um, and spend time with them. Some holidays we'd spend with my father on Christmas. Um, we didn't see much of him at that point. He'd, uh, after my mom's passing, he'd moved down to the Cape. So we saw him maybe once or twice a year. But we, we got a close extended family, and so if we weren't with friends, we were with them. Now, when did, when did you really become seriously involved in ath athletics? Um, I really enjoyed I enjoyed athletics. Um, I started uh, in my first year. I got a bursary at the University of Pretoria, and um, I started running for the university. Um, I got offered to run internationally for South Africa in, on a Paralympic level, but I wasn't making my classes. I was struggling uh, to find time to balance uh, academic academically and and uh, on the sporting front. And it was pretty much in that year that I had to make a decision that uh, if I wanted to do this, I'd have to make a, a living out of it. And so um, I tried to to uh, to turn professional at that point, but there was there wasn't much uh, there wasn't much uh, money in Paralympic sports at the time, so it was a bit of a struggle. Um, <laughs> but I, I I carried on with it, and I'd say that's more or less the point that I that I started taking it uh, far more seriously. At that point in time, did you only compete in, at the Paralympics level or at the disabled level or also able level? Uh, since I started athletics, I mostly only competed on an able body level. I participated in um, meetings which were regional meetings, uh, uh, Hateng North meetings and some provincial meetings. Um, and then on the odd occasion when there were Paralympic or disabled meetings for athletes with amputees, I would participate with them. Um, 
it just so happened that as my times got better every year and I was more and more diligent with my work um, ethic, that in 2007 I had the opportunity to run internationally for the first time abroad. And that's when I started running uh, able body uh, races competitively internationally. And with regard to the prosthetic legs, was there any advancement there? Any improvement? Uh, on the on the running prosthetics, um, on the running prosthetic legs, the the legs that I started running with, um, they had been out um, for several years. By the time I started using them, I think for about ten years. And although there has been a lot of advancement um, in in Paralympic sprinting, um, there are certain brands which you may use, um, but. Um, the one that I'm, I'm with, um, there's no advancement or technology um, that they've improved upon there. Now, if you can take the court through the progress in your athletic career, um, when do you say that you really started to excel? To um, I'd, uh, My lady, I'd, I'd think in 2000 and... 2009 probably um, I ran in Athens I ran uh, 2004 at the Paralympic Games in Athens in 2005 I came um, sixth in South Africa able body at the senior championships I was the sixth sixth fastest or sixth highest ranked athlete in the country over the 400 meters um, then in 2006 um, I went to the World Championships for Athletes with Disabilities in Assen in the Netherlands. Um, I won multiple golds there. In 2007, I ran in the South African National Championships again, at the Senior Championships, Able Body Championships in, in Durban, and I finished second. And then 2008 um, was a difficult year because I was busy with a lot of the testing and, and uh, I, had a, I had a court case with the prosthetic legs that I ran on to prove that they didn't uh, provide any advantage. So I was busy for many months, um, not on the track as I would have liked to have been, but I missed the, I missed the Olympic game qualification by... Why, why did you miss it? I just didn't have enough time to train. So, um, what, what was the problem with your legs, the prosthetic legs? I'd started, although many Paralympic athletes had used the exact same prosthetic leg for for many, many years, there were none that ran the speeds that I ran. And because I wanted to run internationally um, and qualify for the Olympics, there was a dispute between the International Athletic Federation that monitored our sport, that monitors our sport and, um, and myself. And um, I obliged and did testing um, which they asked me to do in, in Cologne in uh, November 2007 and they came back and they said that I had an advantage using the prosthetic legs that I ran on. Uh, we did two days of testing and, and there were no uh, tests done on the actual prosthetic leg itself so um, I decided to dispute it and in order to do so um, I had to be the subject of a lot of testing and I had to spend um, many weeks in America during 2008 doing testing at uh, Rice University which is in Houston and um, it was a con joint effort with um, some scientists from around America, international scientists and with the information that was gathered they found that <coughs> I didn't have an advantage uh, using the prosthetic leg that I run on and so we took it to the Court of Arbitration for Sports. Um, in in early 2008, and um, their finding was a unanimous decision that the prosthetic leg didn't provide an advantage. But at that point, I only had about a month and a half left to qualify for for Beijing. So um, I missed the qualification by less than a quarter of a second, and it was a it was a devastating time for me because I really it was a a goal of mine that I'd really set myself on and um, I really I started working considerably harder after that every year I was trying to find ways to improve myself to be better to be more focused to be lighter to be stronger 
but after 2008 I started from scratch I got uh, new training personnel I got I kept the same coach uh, since I began um, athletics and I still still got him um, and and I just started working harder and harder and then in 2009 I ran some international able body races in 2010 the same in 2011 I represented um, South Africa at the at the world championships and um, we broke the 4x400 meter relay uh, South African record we got a silver in the final um, and personally I, I got to the semi-final and then in 2012 I ran uh, represented South Africa in the Olympic and Paralympic Games Did you experience any difficulties uh, physical difficulties in your running career? Um, I think every athlete, uh, professional athlete, has difficulties with injuries, with travelling, with um, with priorities. Um, I guess uh, with with uh, running with prosthetics, there's often medical problems that come associated with um, fatigue of certain muscle groups. Um, I had a lot of problems with skin with skin irritation inside of my prosthetic legs. Um, you know, just uh, there'd be times that my the skin on my stump would come off because of the amount of running we'd do. So I'd run with uh, like b bandage that was uh, just blooded, and then I'd just rewrap it. And but when you took it off, it would just pull the skin off again. So um, there were were sometimes difficulties with travelling and with with those sort of things. What what difficulties with travelling? Um, the prosthetic leg that I wear has got a high back, so if you sit confined in a confined space um, with your knee at uh, an acute angle, um, it cuts off blood circulation from the back, so you can get blood clotting, which I got on, on several um, flights. Some of them involved hospitalization on landing, um, but that was, you know, on, on rare occasions, but um, traveling is always a having prosthetic legs um, you know if on long if on long trips I if I'd been had an evening flight I'd be wearing my prosthetic legs the entire day and at night I'd want to take them off to let my my stumps breathe um, but if you're catching an international flight you have to be careful because if uh, if something happens on the plane you know I'd, I wouldn't have the luxury of putting on my legs quick enough um, but having a uh, prosthetic leg on it doesn't breathe very well um, the, um, so you just get skin irritation problems and things like that so you have to be very careful with traveling um, as far as um, as far as skin and 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 health issues if you're on your stumps what is your balance like I don't have balance on my stumps. Um, I can stand on my stumps. I can't stand still on my stumps. Um, I put my prosthetic legs next to my bed. When I wake up in the morning, I put them on. Um, and when I go to bed at night, I take them off. So I, I seldom don't. I seldom have a time when I am not wearing my prosthetic legs. On the odd occasion, I'd. If I'm in my room, I wouldn't put them on if I just wanted to stretch or if I wanted to fetch something in a close, close proximity, but I don't have uh, very good balance. I don't have a ankle joint, so I don't have articulation of the ankle and I don't have balance as a, on, a, on a foot, on a heel to toe. So, um, is, is there a difference between your left leg and your right leg? Uh, on my stumps? On um, the heel pad specifically? Yes, on my, on my stumps. Um, the operation that I had, the operations that I had as a, as a, as a infant, um, they removed my heel pad from my, my foot and they put it onto the bottom of my stump. And um, as I've got older, or as I grew, um, the bone below my knee grew. And so the heel pad, um, was supposed to stay at the bottom but it's rotated 
it's rotated as the bone's growing around the back. Um, and it's worse on the left side to the point that I've spoken to my surgeon over the last couple of years to to redo uh, the left stump, m move the heel pad so that there's soft tissue on the bottom of the bones so that I can walk on my stumps better. Um, but I wouldn't have time to take off of my athletic career um, in order to do so. But it, um, the length is similar. The, the right stump um, is about a centimeter longer than the left. But um, because of the heel pad moving on the left stump, I can't place weight on, on my left stump. So I have to rotate my entire leg, my knee joint out to the left when I walk without my prosthetic legs on. And what does that do to your balance? Um, it just throws my weight off completely. It, um, I don't have balance as such. If I have to stand without holding onto something, um, without my, with on my stumps, I have to move around continuously. So I mean, my if uh, if on a Saturday or Sunday morning I was lying in my room and my dog came into my room, it, my dog could knock me over without my without my prosthetic legs on. You competing in the level that you did, did it bring you into contact with any charitable work and to what extent? Um, it, uh, in my athletic career, I was in contact with a lot of charitable work. Um, from uh, 2004, I got involved in a, in a foundation initially run by Rotary. Uh, it was in Mozambique. Um, I went out and I spent some time with the with, uh, people who'd been maimed by landmines, who'd, been, who'd lost their legs from landmines. Um, we, uh, we did some clinics up there, um, and as a result, we formed a foundation called the Soul of Africa and Mind Seeker. Um, there were many patrons, or there were several patrons on both the foundations, which included um, celebrities and presidents and things. Um, Nelson Mandela was a patron of our foundation um, and the work that we did was to provide medical assistance to people that had lost their, their legs from landmines and one, one of the things that we found was that many of the people that had lost their legs hadn't lost it as a result of the war, they'd lost it in the last couple of years. So there were teenagers and young adolescents that weren't able to walk um, who'd never been involved in the war. and through this, um, over the years, I started doing more and more projects. Uh, initially, I'd just go and I'd show the people that having a disability, you know, you could still have lead a normal life and, and lead a life where you could contribute in your society so to subsistence farm in the very rural areas. And then later on, um, it was just about changing people's perceptions. In Mozambique, where I did most of, where I do most of my work, the People are embarrassed about having a disability. So one day I went to the local radio station and I called for the fastest people in the town, it was in Villanculos, to come and race me. And um, we set out a road, piece of the road. We got the municipality to close off the road. And I raced the fastest guys in the town and I won. And all the people who had prosthetic legs all of a sudden weren't ashamed of having prosthetic legs. They all started pulling up their pants and showing everybody else that, look, I've also got a prosthetic leg. And what started off there with being you know, a simple project turned into something um, that I found uh, very important to myself. And about three, four years ago, um, I approached the University of Glasgow. Uh, they've got a special materials department there, which is one of the best in the world. They do a lot of aerospace um, work. And they allowed me uh, pretty much full reign of their engineering departments. And I came up, I designed and came up with a prosthetic foot for Africa. It's a foot that can't melt if, if somebody falls asleep next to a fire, um, which many times is the case in, in, in Africa. A lot of the feet that were being built were very heavy. They weren't durable. They cost a lot of money. So I wanted to, I had a criteria of things that I wanted to uh, overcome by developing this foot. And um, together with the university, we developed a foot. And um, for that, I received my, my an honorary doctorate last year or the year before.
from 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 the University of, of Strathclyde in, in Glasgow. And that was for? For my work, um, my humanitarian work and, and the work in prosthetics and prosthetic developments. Now, becoming more involved in athletics, did it have any impact on your friendships? Um, it, it definitely did. I mean, I, I, I had less time to spend with, with my friends. Um, I was away from home for uh, seven, eight months of the year. I think in 2012, I had just over 100 international flights between May and December. Uh, it had a huge effect on perceived friends. I started earning a decent amount of money. Um, so it changed just a lot of the dynamics in, in a person's life. Um, you obviously get to experience many amazing things that I'm very blessed and very lucky for, but it's hard to come back after not seeing people after five or six months and they're dating different partners or they're engaged or and to bring them up to speed is sometimes not not always easy, so it did change a lot of the friendships that I had. Now, you were also involved in a boating accident. When was that, Mr. Pistorius? Well, my lady, that was in uh, 2009. Um, I... Uh, I was, at the time I was injured, I had an athletics injury, and um, um, on that day, on the Friday night, I went down to watch um, some of my friends compete at uh, athletic events in, in Port Elizabeth, and I came back the following morning and I phoned a friend of mine um, who was staying with me at the time, and I asked him if he wanted to come with me to the Vol River, um, and we arrived there mid-afternoon, and um, after struggling to get the boat into the water, we, we were on the water about, I guess, about s just before six o'clock. Um, we met some of my family and friends um, at, a, at another, <coughs> another place on the water. <coughs> and on returning, um, there were a couple of people on, on my boat and um, some of them were in a rush to get back to the house to cook dinner. And so my cousin was in another boat and I suggested that they go with him um, as, as we were just trying to, we were just taking a leisure, like a, a leisurely cl cruise up the, up the river. And um, it was just my friend John and I in the boat. And at a point um, we were just chatting and sitting and chatting. And um, at a point he stood up to, I think, to light a cigarette or to make a phone call and, and at that point he shouted and I looked forward and I couldn't see anything. Um, the Vol River runs from east to west and we were heading back west so the sun was setting in front of us and I could, I, I could only see the sun on the water and a couple of seconds later um, I just remember the sound of the propeller in the, the boat, I hit the steering wheel and the propeller went into the air. I remember the sound of the engine. Um, and then when I woke up, I felt it was just hot. It was very warm in the boat. Um, it, it, it was very dark where we were. It was, um, I remember my face was very hot and um, the boat was already half, half full with water. And uh, my friend John was in the front of the boat and he was busy picking up um, wallets and things, or f phones and things, and he, he asked me if I was okay. And as he turned around, down, um, I remember him looking at me and I could see that he was shocked. So I, I, well my face was very hot and I grabbed my, 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 kind of my face like this, there was a, like an itch sensation. And at that point I realized that most of my face had been smashed in uh, from my nose down it was just it was pretty much just uh, just uh, muscle tissue and cartilage and um, I phoned my cousin uh, who was on the boat in front of us uh, I remember thinking that I needed to stay calm 
I phoned him and his phone just rang and I ended up phoning my uncle. Um, he wasn't there at the time, but I remember thinking if I, if I, if the boat sinks, when the boat sinks, if my phone gets damaged, at least he could keep on phoning. And so I phoned him and he picked up and I said to him that I was in a boat accident and I needed help. And um, I just remember the boat, sink, the boat sinking. I was standing on the front of the boat and the boat went under. And then I remember um, my friend John swimming with me in the water. I remember the water was hot and cold around us from all the blood. And then um, I remember being dragged onto my cousin's boat. I remember people shouting and screaming in the back. And um, and then I remember when the boat, w I don't remember getting off the boat, but I remember walking from the boat to a car. I don't remember much of the trip in the car, and then I remember um, climbing into an ambulance, um, and uh, my cousin was, was with us. One of my cousins was with us. She was a fifth year medical student at the time, and she um, was telling the paramedic what to do, and there was a lot of confusion. And um, I remember he gave me some injection, but when I woke up, I was, um, I was pretty much drowning on the blood from my head injury because they had strapped me down to a stretcher. So when I woke up, um, it was to revive me and there was a lot of muscle uh, uh, tissue and blood coming out of my, my mouth and my nose. And then I don't remember anything after that. So I remember waking up. Um, I was in a, I was in, a um, in an induced coma for several days and then I woke up in hospital and, and that's, that's all I remember. Was there any impact on you because of the boat accident? Uh, there was a massive impact, um, my lady. Uh, I think I was just a lot more vigilant of um, losing my life after that. I became a bit fearful. I became quite withdrawn. I remember reading in the media that I'd been drinking at the time of the accident and people were joking about it and saying, you know, that I was drunk and this and this, but they didn't understand that I nearly lost my life. Were you drinking? No, I wasn't drinking, my lady. Um, I just remember, I just remember being um, more serious about wanting to take my sport seriously after that. Did keep you back at all in your sport? Uh, that season, I ran. I I ran the same times as I was running when I was seventeen. So I ran. I had a terrible season. I went to Europe. Um, can you give me my phone? This accident was at the end of February. Um, There's something going in my, in my ear. Yeah. But I had my jaw wide closed for four or five weeks. So I've lost a lot of muscle and a lot of weight. Um, I wasn't able to leave home for several weeks. Uh, and I had a lot of stitches. I think I had about 170 stitches in my, in my, in my face. So I just sort of, out of uh, physical standpoints, it just uh, it just took a lot away from my athletic season. And by the time I got to Europe, I wasn't fit. Can I move? Can you move that back, Nana, so that I can? Mr. Pistorius, when you take your prosthesis off, how do you treat them? What do you do with them? Um, I keep them close by. I I usually let them air at night. Um, most of the time I leave my, my, my pants on my prosthetic legs. So in other words, I can take my trousers off and to my ankles and I can take my prosthetic legs off thereafter and leave them on the ground with pants on them. Um, I usually just keep them close by. I usually put them one on top of the other um, and um, when I'm at training at the track, I usually put them next to my bag or I place my bag on top of them or I place my track suit on top of them. Why would you place your bag or your track suit on top of them? Um, I think it's just as an amputee, uh, it's not an uncommon thing. It's, um, 
prosthetic limb or a wheelchair in many disabled people it's an extension of your body I wouldn't leave my prosthetic legs lying around um, and I don't really want to be seen without them or just you know having them lie around so I'd leave them close to my bag or in a bag it's been opportune time my lady what's what's your time two oh, one o'clock my lady we shall take our lunch adjournment. So we have lunch for the